Wow, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a group. There was no way I was going to miss this. The plane was coming in. That plane was coming in. I said, are we okay to the pilot? He said, uh, I think so. I didn't like that answer. I think we're okay, sir. I think we should be okay. I'm saying, should we turn back? He said, I wouldn't mind if we did. I said, I don't have the courage to turn back from these people. Just land the sucker, would you please? A little, little rough weather out there. Thank you very much, everybody. And it's a true honor to be here in this beautiful Nashville with — this is a great place — with the National Religious Broadcasters. What, a, what an important group. And they're giving you a hard time in Washington, but you won't have a hard time in about uh, 11 months from now, I can tell you. You won't have a hard time. Let me begin by saying congratulations on 80 incredible years of spreading the great word of God. It's really great. What you do is very important. Let me thank the President and CEO of NRB, Troy Miller, Executive Vice President Linda Smith, NRB Chairman Jim Sanders. Oh, you got the whole group here tonight. This is power. This is power from above. General Counsel Michael Ferris, Director of Public Policy Noel Heisinger, as well as Ambassador David Friedman. And David, where is David? Where is my David? Are you gonna, I'm gonna get you up here in a little while. I think we gotta hear a little bit about what's going on over there. Former Congresswoman, a terrific person, Michelle Bachman. Where's Michelle? Where is Michelle? Hi, Michelle. Hi. It's been a long time done a great job. Heritage Foundation president, somebody else doing an unbelievable job. He's bringing it back to levels it's never seen. Dr. Kevin Roberts. Kevin, thank you, Kevin. Kevin, thank you, wherever you may be. Thank you, Kevin. Pastor Robert Jeffers, he's up there all the time, and he's always saying good things. A long time ago, when I just uh, announced, he was on Fox, of all places. And he said, uh, no, he may not know the Bible as well as some. He may not know every passage. He may not know it actually so well at all. <laughs> but he's the greatest leader, and he is a believer and a strong believer. And he's going to take us to places that we would never have been taken before. And he turned out to be right. He turned out to be right. So, Robert, thank you very much. Robert Jeffress, great guy. Pastor Jack Hibbs. Thank you, Pastor. Got a lot of — we got a lot of the big shots here tonight. And Pastors James Ward and Sharon Ward, thank you very much. A man who's treated me most of the times pretty good, and I like him, and he is a smart guy. You, you it. Where are you, you? Where are you? Thank you. Another man who's uh, — I just think he's an incredible guy. He's a patriot. He loves this country. Sebastian Gorka. Those two guys are really amazing. And everybody at Salem Media Group, you've been incredible. You really are, and you're very popular. More popular than you would even know. And, of course, a very special thanks to all of the inspiring people in the audience today, the broadcasters and communicators, the brave independent Christian journalists, and they are brave, the missionaries who go to the world's most dangerous places, and I don't know how you do it. You're among the bravest people in the world, and you do a job that nobody could do but you. And the pastors, podcasters, producers, and patriots whose ministry lifts up the spirits of tens of millions of Americans. You do an incredible, an incredible thing for humanity, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's incredible people. Thank you. We're going to save this country. It will be thanks to the men and women like you, like the people in this audience, and we are represented by the best, the people who make God's work your work. God's work your work. That's what you do, and I want to thank you all. Incredible job. Thank you very much. When this legendary organization was founded eight decades ago, it was in another moment of crisis. We are in a crisis right now. We've got a incompetent president who doesn't know what the hell he's doing. <laughs> he will not lead us to the promised land, as the expression goes. 
1944 was the year of D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, and General Douglas MacArthur's famous return to the Philippines. Please sit down. We'll be here for a little while. Thank you. We've got a lot of time. Our country was at war with the enemy and wanted — they wanted to extinguish our way of life forever. It was a very bad time, but here at home, Christians knew that victory depended not only on the force of American arms, but also on the faith in American hearts. And we've got to get more of that back in our country today. We really do have to get more of it back. Your institution was formed to give voice to an army of preachers and ministers and faith leaders who fought every day to strengthen America with the good news of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. Today, we are in another struggle for survival of our nation. I believe it's the most dangerous point in the history of our country because of the power of the weaponry. It's no longer army tanks going back and forth, it's blasting each other out. It's nuclear weapons and other weapons that are just as devastating. And we need brilliant people to do the job. And if you don't have that, it's going to be a very bad time for the world. This time, the greatest threat is not from the outside of our country. I really believe this. It's from within. It's the people from within our country that are more dangerous than the people outside. We can handle China. We can handle Russia. We can handle all of them if you have a smart leader. But the inside people are very dangerous. They're very sick people, in my opinion, in many cases. They're sick. I'm here today because I know that to achieve victory in this fight, just like in the battles of the past, we still need the hand of our Lord and the grace of Almighty God. We have to have that. Our country is being destroyed by a radical left, corrupt political class that has gone communist, Marxist, and even fascist. I used to say we will never have a socialist state. And I was right. We passed over socialism. Socialism's a nice way by comparison to where we are. From Joe Biden on down, and I'm not sure that Biden knows what the hell's going on. I don't think he knows he's alive, actually. And I never used to say that until I got indicted. Then I said, okay, now I can say it like it is. They said, oh, we'll never indict a popular American president. Don't forget, I got more votes. We got more votes, all of us together, than any, than any president, think of it, than any president, sitting president in the history of our country. Got more votes than any, by far, by a lot. And, uh, and lots of bad things happen, very bad. We can never let that happen again. They rigged the election. And look at the mess our country's in right now. Would have never happened, including inflation. Israel wouldn't have been attacked. Ukraine wouldn't have been attacked. China wouldn't be thinking about Taiwan, wouldn't even be thinking about it. There'd be no inflation. It was energy that caused it. We had inexpensive energy. We have more liquid gold under our feet, think of it, than any other country in the world, and we don't use it. We go to Venezuela to get their tar. It's so sad. It's so pathetic. From Joe Biden on down, they have thrown open our borders to an illegal alien invasion by the world's most sadistic criminals and savage gangs, while putting peaceful, pro-life citizens behind bars. We have a new category of crime. I said it last night for the first time. We did a show. Laura Ingram, highest rating she's ever had. How about that? Don't we love that? What do I get out of it? I get nothing. So what difference does it make? What do they give me? Nothing. But there were a lot of people watching. But uh, you just see what, what's happening. You see so many things happening that are just unthinkable. It's unthinkable that millions of people would be allowed into our country. It's unthinkable. Who would, who would do this? They've unleashed mobs of foreign jihadists to praise Hamas in our streets. They're praising Hamas while they slander law-abiding Americans as domestic terrorists. You heard the J6 hostages. You saw the spirit, the spirit that these people have, the spirit. You would think they wouldn't have any spirit left, but they have tremendous spirit. What's happened to them has probably, to that extent, never happened in our country before. They're weaponizing law enforcement to target parents, conservatives, and Catholics, Catholics. 
more than anybody, Catholics, what's going on with Catholics? Do we have any Catholics in this audience? Raise your hand, please. I just want to see. Not too many, but I will tell you, how the hell do you vote for this person? They have gone after Catholics. That's probably why we don't have any of this audience. There are none left. But there's one sitting in first row, and he's a very important one, I will tell you. No, but how Catholics? I mean, they've been — they're being persecuted, Catholics. But evangelicals, and they're all on the list. For all Americans, but especially for Christians, nothing is more important than to defeat this wicked system and to return to fair, equal, and impartial justice under the constitutional rule of law. You have to return to the constitutional rule of law. We're not there. There's much work to be done, but there is no doubt where we have to begin. We have to begin, and we have to begin immediately. The restoration of law and justice in America begins with firing crooked Joe Biden on November 5th, 2024. If we don't fire him, our country, I believe, is doomed. I believe it's doomed. As you know, the left is trying to shame Christians. They try and shame us. Us. I'm a very proud Christian, actually. I've been very busy <laughs> fighting and, you know, taking the, the bullets, taking the arrows. I'm taking them for you, and I'm so honored to take them. You have no idea. I'm being indicted for you, as I say. I'm being indicted over and over and over. I've been indicted more than Al Capone, the great gangster. Scarface. My parents are looking down. They said, do you believe this happened to me? I never heard the word before, you know, essentially. I never heard the word before. Think of it. I've been indicted more than some of the greatest criminals in the world for nothing. For nothing. If, I, if my plane flies over a blue state, that evening I get a subpoena to report to a federal grand jury. Al Capone would have dinner with somebody. If he didn't like the look on his face, he'd kill them. He never gets indicted. No, no. What they're doing is very dangerous for our country. You see it. You see the support I have? Look, this never happened before. When somebody goes through this kind of stuff, they immediately go to the microphone. They say, I will be leaving office now. I will be home. I'm going home and love my family and cherish my family and fight for my name. And that's the last you ever see of this poor person. With me, I get indicted, and my numbers go up. What the hell is going on? Because the people know it's a scam. They understand it. They know we're being scammed. True. It's so true. They want to silence you, demoralize you, and keep you out of politics. Stay the hell out of politics. If I wasn't running, and if I wasn't leading by a lot, you see the polls today, I'm up by 12 points and 14 over crooked Joe Biden. And in a national poll, I'm up by 91 points on, on I won't use the term because it's, some people think it's a little bit nasty, but some people you don't like very much. Uh, Haley, Haley, I'm up 91 points. That's a lot. And in South Carolina, Nikki Haley is losing to me. It looks like she's going to lose by 25 or 30 points. That's a lot. She's governor, but people don't like her too much. And she's hurting the party, but I don't care. Let her run, because think of it. If she's not running, they're not talking about us. So maybe it's better if she runs a little bit. But she's not doing well, and we can't let it happen. You know, it's uh, — we have to stick together as a party. We have enough — enough of a fight on whether you call it the radical left or the communists or the fascists or whatever you want to call them. That's our fight, and we have to save our country. But Christians, they can't afford to sit on the sidelines in this fight. They have to really get out there. They have to do what they have to do, and they have to win. The corrupt persecution by this regime will not stop with me. Oh, it's not going to stop with me. I mean, they they gave me a fine of $355 million for doing nothing wrong. This was a fine like never seen before. And you know the amazing thing? The republic — the people in this country, they understood it immediately. 
It's all a big hoax. If I wasn't running, I wouldn't have been sued. None of these indictments would happen. And if I wasn't, once I started winning, I said to my wife, I said, our great first lady who sends her regards, she loves everybody in this room. But I said, when I saw these numbers where we're way ahead, I said, oh, this is going to be painful. I'm going to probably get another 12 indictments in the next week or two. <laughs> Although they're backfiring, I know I heard in one case they were getting ready to do it, and they got a call from Washington, don't do it. We're going to indict this guy into office. <laughs> but they're bad people. The chains are already tightening around all of us. I mean, if you think about it, ultimately, the radical left is coming after all of us because they know that our allegiance is not to them. Our allegiance is to our country, and our allegiance is to our Creator. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. How any Christian can vote for a Democrat, Christian or person of faith, Person of faith, how you can vote for a Democrat is crazy. It's crazy. They've got to stop. They've got to stop because uh, it's hard. You know, we have to we have to really go out and, on November 5th, and we have to get votes like nobody ever got before because they always cheat. We, we have some great safeguards, a lot of things. The last time, well, we won one that we weren't supposed to win. They went crazy. And they decided to do things that they shouldn't be doing. And we were somewhat unsuspecting. And they did something that really has set back our country tremendously. But we're going to get votes. I will tell you, we did phenomenally in 2016. We won. We did much better in 2020. We got millions and millions of more votes. And we got scammed. And the enthusiasm was probably the likes of which nobody's ever seen in an election in this country for the both of them. The enthusiasm for this election coming up in November is far greater than it was in 2016 or 20, 2020. Far greater. It's not even a contest. I've never seen anything like it. Even coming over here, everybody has a Trump sign. Trump, Trump, Trump. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're still nine months away, a little more than nine months away. And the sad part is that the incompetence of this man and this administration can do tremendous damage in nine months. And it's a long time. You know, nine months sounds like it's short, and it, uh, politically speaking, is pretty short. It's not a long period. But the damage they do is just overwhelming, what they're allowing to happen to our country. What they cannot stand is that, in the end, we do not answer to bureaucrats in Washington. We answer to God in heaven. We do. We answer to God in heaven. So today, I come before you as a friend and an ally and a fellow believer to ask for your help and your support and your prayers for this country. We need your prayers, most importantly. And I make you a simple promise. In my first term, I fought for Christians harder than any president has ever done before. You know that. You know that. And I will fight even harder for Christians with four more years in the White House. We did things that uh, the likes of which nobody has ever done for Christians in this country, and I'm very proud of that and honored by it. Just think of what, with God's help, we already achieved in our historic first term. Just a few of the things under my leadership and working with you and a lot of the great people in the room. Jack, thank you very much, by the way. You see you sitting there. Everyone knows who I'm talking about. Thank you very much. Great job. And so many others. Under my leadership, we did more to uphold religious freedom than any administration in history, and everybody agrees. So, Robert, I guess you were right, weren't you, huh? We fearlessly protected the conscience rights of doctors, nurses, teachers, and faith groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. We fought very hard alongside of them. And we had some incredible results. I blocked the IRS from using the Johnson Amendment to interfere with pastors' freedom of speech. And Joe Biden is trying to take it back. He's trying to take it away. They used that. I'll never forget, I was in New York in Trump Tower. It was 2015. I had probably 45 pastors, some rabbis, and uh, but we had people of faith and teachers of faith and very people I want to hear from. And 
I said, I'd love to have your endorsement. And they looked a little bit like bewildered. Because I didn't know what the hell. I never ran for office before. Now I'm running for president and I'm leading. And I say, I want to have your endorsement. And they said, no, I don't. Uh, I just can't do that. I, I'm wondering, because they had come up two or three times. We got along great. We all agreed on just about everything. But when I said, uh, I'd love to have your endorsement, uh, the room went sort of silent. And I called one of them over and I said, what's wrong? I don't understand. Why wouldn't you endorse me? I mean, the person you're talking about, and you could go either way, whether it's Biden or Hillary Clinton. I don't use the word crooked for I took that word away from her and I put it now on Biden. I call her now, I call her now beautiful Hillary. She's a beautiful woman. But I said, why aren't they endorsing me? I'm so much better. I mean, I don't want to brag, but I am so much for what you are all about and what you're about is the most important thing. They said, sir, we're not allowed to. We have a thing called the Johnson Amendment. I never heard of that. I said, what is it? Well, if we openly support somebody uh, politically, we could lose everything. Uh, they'll take away paper. We have a tax-exempt status. They'll take that away. Churches will be devastated. We'll be devastated. I said, I never knew that. This was Lyndon Johnson, very powerful president, actually, powerful guy. He knew how to get things done, and he had a problem with, I guess they say, a pastor in Houston or Dallas, big problem. And he did this. He put this horrible rule into effect, and it was a very strong rule. And I said, so, and we were on the 68th floor of Trump Tower, and we're looking down on Fifth Avenue. I said, so that means that any person down there has equal power to you people, and you're the people that everybody wants to listen to, but you're not allowed to back that up because you need some political strength. They said, essentially, that's right. We can't really do anything because we'll lose tax-exempt status and other things. And I said, that's too bad. I said, if I get in, we are going to totally void out the Johnson Amendment, and I was able to do that. We voided it out, and uh, you were able to speak because you're the people that I want to hear from and that other people want to hear from, and you're not allowed to speak. And you should be allowed, if you see somebody that believes in Christianity, if you see somebody that loves evangelicals or Israel, which has become more and more prominent in your thoughts and your prayers, you should be able to vote and, and to promote the person that's uh, backing the ideas that you love and cherish and are very important. So I thought it was the most ridiculous thing. Anyway, we got rid of it, and people took a much more active stance, and that's great. And we're going to do it again, and we're going to get it out now permanently. We were putting it in the tax, but we had tremendous bite back on that. But for four years, we went through uh, a great period. You were able to speak, and we're going to make that on a permanent basis. You're going to be able to do it because you're the people we want to hear from, the pastors and the ministers and the rabbis. The people in this room are the people we want to hear from, and they have to have a political voice. You know, if you think about it, you have men. You have women, and you have religion. If you look at it, you have more than the men. You have more than the women. You have such power. But you really, you weren't allowed to use that power. And you're now allowed to use it. I get in there, you're going to be using that power at a level that you've never used it before. It's going to bring back the churchgoer. I mean, you have to see. I don't like the charts when I see charts where they're going in the wrong direction. We don't like that. We're going to bring it back. And I really believe it's the biggest thing missing from this country. It's the biggest thing missing. We have to bring back our religion. We have to bring back Christianity in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I issued guidance to making clear that the right of freedom to worship does not end at the door at a public school and I supported school prayer, very important school prayer, which we forced, unfortunately, had to force into some schools. It should be very easy. You would think it would be very easy, but it wasn't, but we did it. I was the first and only president to convene a meeting of the United Nations to end religious persecution worldwide. First time they've ever done it. Uh, they were not thrilled, but that was okay. They did it. I signed an executive order to install faith advisors in every federal department and agency so that your voice and the Christian worldview would be heard in the halls of power in Washington and all over the world. It was a very big deal. 
Very proud of it. Wasn't that easy to do, you know that? Four years, we totally transformed the federal bench, appointing nearly 300 federal judges to interpret the law, and the Constitution has written a record. 300. I withstood vicious attacks to pick and confirm three great Supreme Court justices. The great, great justices, great people. The great people, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett. We nobody thought that was going to even be possible. We fought. This was not. This was not an easy thing to do. From my first day in office, I took historic action to protect the unborn, like nobody has ever done. Nobody has ever done it. Thank you. I reinstated and expanded the Mexico City policy. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't do it. Nobody did it. Nobody did it like us. And was the first president ever to attend the March for Life rally in Washington, D.C. It was a great honor. And I was able to bring this issue for the first time in 54 years back to the states where everybody agrees on both sides. Everybody agrees that's where it should be, back in the states. It was so important. Everybody on both sides. And they are the radicals. Remember this. They try and paint a picture of disinformation, misinformation, almost the same, but actually not quite. But we won't go into that. But it's disinformation. And they try and paint a picture because they're willing to kill the unborn in the sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth months, and even after birth. I mean, uh, even after birth. You remember the governor, that former governor of Virginia, that said, the baby will be born, and we will decide to kill the baby after birth. We will make a decision with the mother. This is the first time I heard that. But there is legislation in some states where you actually have the right to do that. So they're the radicals. You're not the radicals. We're not the radicals. They're the radicals. And you have to say that. Politicians have to say that. Because nobody believes that after a certain period of time, nobody believes that you should be doing this. It's like 97 percent agree. Uh, we also have to remember that we have to have people elected. So some things that uh, you feel and you have to go with your heart, you have to stay with that. You have to stay with your heart. But you have to get elected. You have to get people elected. But what a difference a president makes. You saw that during my term. What a difference a president makes. So, so big. Bigger than anything else. As I mentioned earlier, under crooked Joe Biden, pro-lifers are now being hunted down by the Biden regime as enemies of the state. Can you believe that? The same Biden DOJ that dropped charges against Antifa, where they kill people, where they destroy cities. Take a look at Portland. You can't even walk down the street. It's just — they don't even have storefronts anymore. They use two-by-fours, because if they put up a piece of glass to show their wares, it gets knocked out. Well, most of the stores are empty, so it doesn't matter. But uh, take a look at what they did there. Take a look at what happened in Seattle, where they took over a big portion of the city. They literally took it. If I wasn't going to send in the troops, we were sending in the troops the next day. All of a sudden, they decided to leave. But the governor didn't want to do it. The governor didn't want to do it and uh, would have never done it. They'd still be there if I didn't do what I did. You take a look at Minnesota, Minneapolis. You take a look at what they were doing with that. If I didn't send in the National Guard and the governor didn't want it, and uh, if I didn't send it, you wouldn't have — you wouldn't have that city anymore. I remember the CNN announcer saying, this is a nonviolent protest. And behind him, the entire city was burning to the ground. Do you remember this? This is nonviolent in every way. I don't see a problem. And he also got hit on the knee with something, and he went down. And the city behind him was burning. I never saw anything like it. But they're, you know, they're fake news. What can I say? I think one of the terms, they say, you come up with good names. I said, maybe fake news was the best. They're fake news. You know, when I uh, first started, <laughs> fake news. When I first started, the press had a very high rating. People actually believe them. You know, you think you read something in the New York Times, it's true. It's usually the opposite. Uh, the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, they kept it going, going. It was supposed to be a one-day deal. It was a way of explaining why Hillary Clinton lost election that a lot of people thought she was going to win. 
Most people, I guess, thought that. I didn't think it, because we'd go to rallies for, with 45,000 people, and she'd show up, and they'd have 25 people show up. I said, why are, it's true, why are we going to win? But we won that, and uh, the news just went crazy. And it was supposed to be a one-day event, Russia, 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 and let's get on to running the country. But that went on for two and a half years. And then they had the Mueller report, and it came in, no collusion. But I could have told them that on day one. And they would have known that on day one. They should have known it, because they had the laptop from hell. So they should have known it. <laughs> that was, you have to say, that was truly the laptop from hell, wasn't it? Though? <laughs> Miranda Devine wrote a great book on it. And she was very nice. She credited me. She said, I got the name from Donald Trump. I saw him calling it the laptop from hell, and she named her book the laptop from hell. It was very, very successful. I didn't get anything out of it, though, Moran. <laughs> but it was a good book. It was. Can you imagine if they didn't? Can you imagine if he would have gone and picked up the laptop? David, it would have been a whole different country out there for them. But that is a uh, — oh, and, and what they have is peanuts compared to what's on that thing. If that were from the other side, if that were a Republican instead of them, uh, the things that are on that are unbelievable, unexplainable. The same Biden DOJ that dropped charges against Antifa has rounded up six pro-life activists right here in Tennessee, arresting them for a peaceful protest outside a clinic where they prayed, sang hymns, and were removed with great force. Last month, those protesters were convicted on outrageous charges and are now facing up to 11 years in prison. This is a communist — this is a communist state, just so you understand. This is the beginning of a communist state, uh, whether it's me or any one of another thousand things that are going on. This is the only way they're going to be able to stay in office, because they're running a regime that's so incompetent, nobody's ever seen anything like it. Everything they do, high interest rates, the open borders. I don't think there's ever been anything so egregious that we've seen as these open borders, where these millions of people are allowed to just come into our country and invade this country. You saw that mountain? We built the wall, all of these hundreds of miles of wall. We ended it at that mountain. They said, nobody can go over that mountain. And we put it, boom, right into that wall. We figured we had at least we had something done that was good. The people are pouring over. It's sort of known as Stake Mountain, Stake Hill, Snake. It's Snake. A lot of snakes. I think they're rattlesnakes. Between the rattlesnakes and the rough terrain and the steepness, they said, nobody's coming. The people are coming over by the thousands. It's crazy. And we let them come over. We let them do it. Our country can withstand. No country can withstand what's happening to us. The cities are being inundated. They're being overrun. They're taking the parks from children. There are no more baseball fields, no more soccer fields, no more anything. It's, it doesn't sound very serious. Soccer fields and baseball fields are very serious. Their way of life has changed, and they're being treated better than long-time American citizens, and they're being treated better than our soldiers, our veterans, are being treated. They're staying in world-class hotels. The whole thing is crazy, what's happening in our country. Let's call these brave Americans what they really are, persecuted Christians. They're being persecuted. And let's call their imprisoned and imprisonment. They are being imprisoned by Joe Biden and his people, evil people. He's surrounded by very evil people. They are, I believe, just doing whatever they want to do. I don't believe they have any leadership at all. Joe Biden, because of his gross incompetence, is a threat to democracy, big threat to democracy. To reverse these monstrous abuses of power, the moment I win the election, I will appoint a special task force to rapidly review the cases of every political prisoner who has been unjustly victimized by the Biden regime. Never again will the federal government be used to target religious believers. They are targeting religious believers. What they did to all of you, a lot of ground was lost by religion during COVID, during the China virus. Let's be more accurate. It's called the China virus. We want to be accurate, have to be accurate, or you'll get criticized. <laughs> you'll get criticized by the fake news. But Americans of faith are not a threat.
to our country. Americans of faith are the soul of our country. They are. They're the soul of our country. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of honor. I really do. It's crazy. I, I've got to have something a little bit different up there, but I do, because I'm being indicted for you. And never forget, our enemies want to take away my freedom, because I will never let them take away your freedom. I'm never going to let it happen. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. I just happen to be standing in the way. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Not the easiest thing I've ever done. Building buildings was much easier. Remember, every communist regime throughout history has tried to stamp out the churches, just like every fascist regime has tried to co-opt them and control them. And in America, the radical left is trying to do both at the same time. There's never been anything like this. It's really dangerous, okay? It's really a bad thing. And uh, you're going to leave this room, and you're gonna, some will say, oh, I think it's an over-exaggeration. And some will say it's actually maybe not even up to what it should be as a statement. It's very dangerous out there. They're doing bad things. They want to tear down crosses where they can and cover them up with social justice flags, which nobody even knows what it means. Nobody knows. They don't know what it means. They want to take off the name George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson off schools and off monuments. Think of it. They take down statues like it's uh, the my most magnificent statues you, anyone's ever seen. And they knock them down like they were garbage and uh, so bad. But I see where the other day they wanted to take the name George Washington off a of school. George Washington. When you lose George Washington, you've just about to hit the bottom. That means everything comes off the names of buildings. Even the name Trump is going to be off the buildings. There won't be a Trump up there. I can guarantee you that. If Washington can't make it and Lincoln can't make it, I'm going to have a big problem having my name on buildings. But no one will be touching the cross of Christ under the Trump administration. I swear to you, that will never happen. Never happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're not going to let that happen. When I return to the White House, I will once again aggressively defend religious liberty just like I had for four years. You had no problems. But we're going to defend it in all of its forms. We will protect Christians in our schools, in our military, in our government, and in our — all of those airwaves that your people — that uh, you, Ewan, and Sebastian Gorka, and all of the rest of you — I see a lot of you out there that — that you do such a great job in in talking about in your broadcasts. And in Salem, what the job you do is great. I'm telling you, Salem has really done a fantastic job. I just want to thank you. You have courage. You have really courage, because I know it's not easy. Congratulations. And we will protect God in our public square, which they don't want us to do. I will never allow the big media or left-wing pressure groups to silence you, censor you, discriminate against you, or in any way tell you what you have to say. They want you to say what they want you — what they want to have you say. And we're not going to let that happen. You're going to say as you want, and you're going to believe. And you're going to believe in God. You're going to believe in God because God is here, and God is watching. God is watching. And God probably can't believe what he's seeing. I think Jack, I think he's having a hard time with this one. He's trying to figure — well, maybe he isn't, but everyone else is, I can tell you. He probably understands it very well, better than anybody. There's enough filth on our airwaves. American families need a haven where our children can be taught our values, not have radical values forced upon them, the families and the children. We don't want that. Our children — Hear enough about pronouns. What is with pronouns? If you really study it and look at it, it's — it's sick. It's sick. 
I will protect the content that is pro-God. We're going to protect pro-God context and content. To that end, at the request of the NRB, I will do my part to protect AM radio in our cars. You know, we like to listen to AM radio because you know what we're listening to. Millions of Americans value listening to Christian broadcasters, and you're under siege. I know what you're going through. And this happened. This is a phenomenon that's just really happened. While they're on the road, we support you, and we are supporting all of those believers and the people that believe in you. We're not going to abandon you, and we're not going to abandon those great people that do these incredible broadcasts. They're incredible people. They're brave people. They shouldn't have to be brave people. They're smart people. They shouldn't have to be brave people. They should be nothing brave about it, but they're brave people because of this crazy government that we're developing more and more. It's a fascist government. The Biden administration wants to do major harm to you. You cannot let people vote for these people. You cannot let people vote for the Democrats. They're really wanting to change our whole system of values. Upon taking office, I will create a new federal task force on fighting anti-Christian bias. It's become a very big term, anti-Christian bias. Not believable that you have a term like that, is it? When you think about it, it's like, where did that come from? And it's very, a very recent phenomenon. Its mission will be to investigate all forms of illegal discrimination, harassment, and persecution against Christians in America. As President, I will once again appoint rock-solid conservative judges in the mold of Justices Antonin Scalia and the great Clarence Thomas, who's doing a phenomenal job. Strong. I will stand proudly with our friend and ally, the State of Israel. We will stand proudly with Israel. In our first term, I kept my promise, recognized Israel's eternal capital. That was a big thing. Everybody said, oh, wow. You know, every president, David Friedman, every president for decades was saying during their process of getting elected, during the process that uh, we will name the capital, we will move to Jerusalem, we'll do all of these things. Never happened. And I understood why, because once I got in, the pressure that was put on me by other countries was extraordinary. And I've told the story when I was going to move our embassy to Jerusalem, therefore becomes the capital of Israel. Uh, I was getting calls by leaders of other countries, very powerful leaders, uh, some leaders not so far away from Israel, frankly. And they'd say, what is it about? It's about Jerusalem. It's about the capital. And I said, this is tough. I, I'm doing it, so there's no reason to go through these long calls. So I said, please tell them I'll call them back. This was a Wednesday. Please tell them I'll call them back on Monday. Okay, so I called back on Monday. So on, I believe, a Thursday or whatever, I announced we had a news conference. It was incredible. I announced that we were doing this. And uh, it was tremendously, you know, don't forget, they said the world was going to come to an end if this happened. Well, nothing happened. Everybody waited. They said this will be the bloodiest thing that's ever happened in history, and nothing happened. And I thought that was probably going to be the result, but nothing happened. But uh, I did it, and Israel, therefore, became the capital. Then it was a big thing. And uh, on Monday, I called back the biggest leaders in the whole world, richest leaders, biggest leaders. I said, uh, hi, what's up? <laughs> they said, I called about Israel and your naming your name of the embassy, putting it into Jerusalem. And uh, it's too late, isn't it? I said, yeah, I did. I wish I spoke to you earlier. <laughs> David was there, right? That was a little easier than getting into arguments. I also recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. That was a big one. That was a big one. Probably not that we did it for dollars, but probably worth trillions of dollars. As a real estate professional, I will tell you, that was a, that was a big deal. And you know, they were, 
negotiating that out for 62 years. They play, every year, planes would fly in, fly out, fly in, fly out. They'd have a meeting every year for many, many years, like over 60 years, I think. I called David Friedman into my office. I said, Dave, David, explain the Golan Heights to me, please, in five minutes or less. Now, this has been going on for 68 years or something. The planes would come in that had these big summits that leave nothing would happen. And he did. He explained it in less than five minutes. And I said, let's do it. And I just did it. And uh, it's a big deal. But the biggest thing I did, in my opinion, the biggest thing was I withdrew from the disastrous Iran nuclear deal that Israel never wanted. Now, the problem is, the problem is that the Biden administration did nothing. We could have made any deal we wanted. That deal was done. Iran was broke, totally broke. I had no money because I said anybody buying oil from Iran is not doing any business in the United States, right? And China stopped. They all stopped. They were doing no business. Iran was broke. They had no money for Hamas. They had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for anything. They were totally broke. And we could have made any deal we wanted. No more nuclear weapons. You cannot let them have a nuclear weapon. And we were all set to do it. When the election ended, and you saw, you know the result, it's, it's a, it'll go down as a tragedy in our country, in my opinion, one of the great tragedies. And everyone knows it was all rigged and screwed up. A horrible thing happened. Anytime you have mail-in voting, too, you're going to have a crooked election. Remember that. Mail-in voting. Even Jimmy Carter, with his commission, said you can't have mail-in voting. France gave it up. You know, France had a, an election recently, 36 million votes. Paper ballots, same-day voting, voter ID, very simple. The election ended. You had a winner. You had a loser. And uh, at any time you have mail-in voting, you're going to have problems. Most countries, many countries have just given it up. You can't, it can't possibly work. But with the historic uh, Abraham Accords, we did the Abraham Accords. It's one of the greatest things ever done for peace in the Middle East. But uh, the Biden administration didn't take advantage of it, and they didn't take advantage of the weakness at that time of Iran. So when I got out, Iran went about selling oil at levels they've never hit before. China went back to buying. India went back to buying. France went. They all went back to buying. Everybody was buying. And now Iran has $235 billion. They made it over the last three years. $235 billion. Iran is a very rich country right now. And uh, what a shame. It was a great time. We could have negotiated any deal. We don't want to hurt anybody, but we just don't want them to have a nuclear weapon, because when they have a nuclear weapon, very bad things are going to happen. And they're very close to having that now. That would have been, had the election not been rigged, we would have had a deal with Iran within one week after that election. One week, they were dying to make a deal, because they really, they were hurting. And uh, it would have been a great deal for, for the world. It would have been a good deal for them. I was. I want them, I want everybody to be happy. They just can't have a nuclear weapon. So it was one of those things. But the other is that, again, Ukraine wouldn't, we wouldn't have been, I just looked at something that, some reports that just came out on Ukraine, the death there and destruction is just unbelievable. And Israel would have never been attacked. All of these things, none of them would have happened. And you, again, you wouldn't have had inflation because it was caused by the price of oil. It was caused by the price of energy. And everything went up and is out of control. Now every, everything is hurting. Everything is hurting. And, and by the way, the numbers on inflation are so massive over a three-year period. I think the real number is probably 38 percent, that no matter how much you made, you're losing a lot of money. You're way behind the eight ball. I also cut off funding for the United Nations organizations that were funneling billions of taxpayer dollars to Hamas, yet Joe Biden gave it back. Close to a billion dollars. He gave him a billion dollars back. I also ended, as you remember, Nord Stream 2, the Russian pipeline. And then they say, oh, I like Russia. I'm so friendly. This is the biggest thing they ever did. I ended it. Think of it. The biggest thing, the biggest deal, the most profitable deal, the greatest deal they've ever done. I ended it. It was dead. And Biden came in and he approved it right away. 
But he killed the Keystone Pipeline. He killed our pipeline. He let Russia build their pipeline to Germany and all over Europe. And then they say, well, Trump was uh, very friendly with Putin. Putin said, man, if you're a friend, I'd hate like hell to see you as an enemy. I'd like to ask a man uh, who's with us tonight, and he's been with me the entire way, Ambassador David Friedman, just come up and say a few words and give us a little of that wisdom, please. Thank you. This brings back great memories, really great memories. Mr. President, I just want to say a couple of things that I think everybody here thinks is obvious, but we need to say it anyway. Um, the first, you were the greatest friend that Israel ever had in the Oval Office. By far. By far. The, the second thing is that the, the, the tragedy that is now befalling the state of Israel, and it breaks me out my heart, and I, I work on this every day, and I go back and forth. I'm wearing a, uh, this is to commemorate the hostages, still 130 hostages that are being held in the worst conditions. Um, as you said, this wouldn't have happened uh, had we still been in power, had you still been in power, had I still been working for you, for obvious reasons, because the money that now Iran is using to sell oil, the money that you cut off to the Palestinians that they now have, the money you cut off to the United Nations that they still have. All of this was the lubricant uh, that enabled um, Hamas to conduct their horrible attacks in Hezbollah too. Uh, it, took, it took a lot of money. You cut it all off and President Biden brought it all back. And so we, we really wish, we really wish he never left office because we're feeling the pain right now because of that. And, and the last thing, the last thing I'll just say is when you move the embassy to Jerusalem, um, and, and we were there together in the Situation Room, and you, you, got, you got pushed back from other countries, but you also got pushed back from some of your own people. And I was there with you, and I remember what you said. You said, I promised I'm going to do this, and this is the right thing. And the signal that you sent to the world, not just to those people in that room, but to the whole world, is that the United States will stand with its allies, and the United States will not flinch from the threats of rogue nations. And that message, as much as it elated me and it elated everybody else in this room, that message resonated. It resonated in North Korea and it resonated in Iran. It resonated in Russia. And when the history books are written, I believe that is one of the reasons why under your administration there were no new wars. We owe you a great, great, a great, great gratitude that we cannot repay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Did a great job. Uh, you know, uh, during the debate, Hillary Clinton said, he will lead us into war. He will lead us. Look at the attitude. Look at this guy. He's going to lead us into war. I said, no, no, my attitude will keep us out of war. We defeated ISIS 100 percent and then pulled everyone out. And we were, I guess they say, the first one in 72 years or something like that. I'll tell you just a quick story about Jerusalem. So a friend of mine, very rich guy in New York, has a beautiful office in a big building. And across from the elevator, he has beautiful stone. And every time I see him, he tells me about the stone, how beautiful it is. I get tired of it, actually. Look how beautiful. And he goes, it's Jerusalem stone. Jerusalem comes out of Jerusalem. He's Jewish. It comes out of Jerusalem. Look at it. It's so beautiful, isn't it? I said, yeah. You know, for the 12th time, I said, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Big deal. So what happened is when I approved the deal, and now we're all set with the deal. It was done. It was uh, done, and it went. And nobody was fighting, and there was no bloodshed, no nothing. Uh, but I said, let's build the embassy, because this embassy will never get built the way government works. So a general came in with a $2 billion form for me to sign. That was what they were going to build on. Build on. They were going to spend $2 billion to build an embassy. $2 billion to build. I think of it as a one- or two-story building. How do you do that? I'm in the real estate business. You don't spend that kind of money. But they were going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a lousy site, bad location. We like good locations. And I sent David. I said, David, go check it out because they want me to sign. I told the general I didn't want to sign $2 billion. I didn't want to be foolish. 
And uh, I said, go see if we have any buildings. You know, the United States has been around a long time. Usually we have the best site. Or you could look at the post office site in Washington, D.C. Always get a post office, because that's always the first thing the federal government, they always have the best location. But I said, see if we have a, a good site in our inventory of sites. And lo and behold, two days later, David Friedman calls me back. He said, sir, we have a great site. It's much better than the site that we're talking about, and we own it. I said, does it have a building on it? Yeah, it does. And it's set back. You know, there are certain rules. They want it set back, I guess, for obvious reasons, called explosions on a sidewalk. The building is set back. It's up high. It has beautiful views. Everything is perfect. And we could probably use the frame, use the structure, save a lot of money and a lot of time. So this new building would have probably never been built. It would be built for years and years, decades, probably. It would have spent billions of dollars, and they would have had nothing. I said, let's get it built. So he comes back. He sends me some pictures. I say, listen, go out, and let's see what we can do. And you have to do me a favor. You're in Jerusalem. See if you can make a good deal on Jerusalem stone. Because a friend of mine tells me it's so expensive and so impossible to get. So David calls me back about five days later. He said, sir, I think we can do the building. I said, how much, David? About $490,000. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, does that include Jerusalem stone? He said, the whole place is Jerusalem stone. We have so much Jerusalem stone in Jerusalem, we could get it cheaper than brick. So, right? It's a beautiful building. I don't think they ever have to do anything with it. I think it's beautiful. They'll probably someday knock it down and spend $3 billion to build a building that's terrible, but it's a beautiful building. So we not only named the site and did the capital of Israel and all of those things that all other presidents failed, many, many presidents, they all campaigned on it, and then they never had the guts. I now realize why, though, because of the pressure from other countries. But we got it built, and we got it built in about five months. And it opened, and we, it's a great fanfare, and it's such a beautiful building. It really is, and it's just about all in Jerusalem stone. They even sent me a piece of Jerusalem stone with a dedication, which I proudly have in my office. But under my leadership, we will restore peace through strength before I even arrive at the Oval Office shortly after we, because we, it's going to be we, win the presidency. I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled. We'll have it totally settled. We're going to get it settled. We're going to get it settled. People are dying. Too many people are dying. You saw that evening when I was interviewed on CNN six, seven months ago by a person that didn't like me particularly. I thought they were doing it because they wanted to come a little bit more to the center and try and get some ratings because they're dying in the ratings. Whoops, there goes CNN. There goes the light. Just the red light just went off. I wonder what that means. I wonder what that means. But, but, we all know what that means, don't we? We all know what that means. But it was a war. All of these wars would have never happened. None of it would have happened. If I was president, none of it would have happened. As the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. And I will be, I promise, I will be your peacemaker in more ways than what you think. I will be your peacemaker, and I will be the only president that will be able to say this, say this and say it with great conviction. I will prevent World War III. We're very close to World War III, and this will be a war like no other. They went to... Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who's the Prime Minister of Hungary, is a very tough — he's a very tough man. He's a strong man. He's a friend of mine, a strong man. I actually endorsed him. Can you believe it? I endorsed — I said, uh, why do you need an endorsement? You're a very popular guy. He said, I'd like to have it anyway. And he won by a record astounding number. He's a great guy. He's a strong guy, loves his country. And they were interviewing him a few weeks ago, and they asked him, What's going on with the world? What are we doing? Everything's blowing up the Middle East. You look at Israel, and you look at Ukraine, and you look at possibly China and the threats from North Korea. Everything is a disaster. What do we do? He said, it's a very simple thing. Elect Donald Trump president of the United States, and it's all going to go away. He was the only person that people listened to. He said it actually stronger than that, but I don't want to say it. He said everybody was afraid of Trump. 
I don't know if they were afraid or not. I don't care if they were afraid or not, but they, we wouldn't be having any of these things that are happening right now. None of them. Millions of people would be alive if you add it all up. Both sides. I'm talking about both sides. People are from both sides, not just from our side. Millions of people would be alive right now if everything happened differently on that horrible election period. We no longer have election day. We used to have election day. Now we have election period. Some of them last for 45 days. And what they do during those 45 days is very bad. A lot of bad things happen. I will stop the disaster known as Bidenomics, and we will return to Meganomics, putting America first at all times. We will stop Biden's inflation nightmare. I will cut your taxes and regulations, and we will drill, baby, drill. Our, our, uh, we have more than anybody, remember that, more than anybody. Liquid gold, I call it. On day one, I will seal the border and stop the invasion of our country. It's an invasion, just like a military invasion. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in U.S. history, and now we have the worst border in the history of the world. There's never been a border so bad as this or so dangerous. As soon as I take the oath of office, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, and we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history, because we have no choice. We have no choice. I will also use Title 42 to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families in their home countries starting immediately. We will bring back law and order in our country. I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical, out-of-control prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, in reverse enforcement of the law. What they're doing is so illegal. I am also going to indemnify all police and police officers, all law enforcement officials throughout the United States to protect them from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong actions on crime. They want to take their pensions. They want to take their job. They want to take their family. They want to destroy their lives because they want to protect us. And uh, we're going to indemnify those people. We're going to indemnify the law enforcement officers that can clean up and straighten out all of the crime that's going on. We have crime at a level that nobody's ever seen before. Our inner cities are a disaster. We're going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope, safety, and beauty better than they've ever been before. We'll work with Democrats. They're all run by the Democrats, all of these horrible places that have become so horrible, once beautiful, but have become so unsafe. And we will take over the terribly run capital of our nation in Washington, D.C., and clean it up, renovate it, and rebuild our capital city so that it no longer is a nightmare of murder and crime, but rather it will become the most beautiful capital anywhere in the world. We're going to make it the most beautiful capital anywhere in the world. It once probably was, but we will make it definitely. But we're going to clean up the crime. People go from Tennessee to Washington, D.C., and they end up getting killed. They end up getting shot, mugged. Terrible things happen, and uh, can't be that way. Can you imagine foreign leaders coming in from other lands? They hear all about Washington, the United States, and they're driving in dirty roads, potholes all over the place, medians that are falling down into the road, and crime and graffiti. Graffiti all over those beautiful marble columns, swastikas. Can you imagine what they must think about our country? And I worked hard on that. You know, when I was — when any — any time I drive, when I saw, like, one or two tents starting to form, I said, go out there immediately and take down those tents, because it was easy when you have two or three or four. But now you take a look at what's happened. It looks like Tent City, some of our most beautiful parks. What they've done to our, our country is not — Believable. It's so sad to see. Another top priority will be to take back our education system from the communists and the freaks that are destroying it. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school, pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto our children. 
Thank you. I will support a policy of universal school choice, allowing parents to choose the public-private charter or religious school that that best suits their children. And I will support America's homeschool families, including allowing 529 education savings accounts to be used for homeschooling expenses up to $10,000 a year per child, completely tax-free. So you can do that if you like it. And to me, very importantly, I will close the Federal Department of Education, and we will move everything back to the states where it belongs and where they can individualize education and do it with love of parents, love of everybody, but most importantly, the love and respect of their student. Move it back. You know, we're last on every list. We're first on the list of the cost of education per student. We spend more per student by far than any other country. But we're last in terms of results. The results are horrible. We're going to move it back to the states. I mean, I know states that will do a phenomenal job. Most of them, some I don't think will do really that good of a job. They run — usually, if they run badly, the school's not going to be so great. But many of these states will bring back world-class education in terms of schooling, and they're going to do that. We're going to move it back. We're going to get it out of Washington. We're going to move it back. We're going to end the so-called Department of Education. We might have one desk, one person, just to make sure everyone's speaking English. Let's — got to have a little bit of regulation, you know. Let's — let's try and keep it so that you can only, like — that we're going to focus on some English. But after that, you can go ahead and do what you're going to do, but you can't do worse. You know, we're at the bottom of every list. Every single list, we're at the bottom, and yet we spend more per pupil, so we're going to move it back to the States. I will also take historic action to defeat the toxic poison of gender ideology and restore the timeless truth that God created two genders, male and female. <laughs> So crazy. And something that I am always amazed that I have to say, I will keep men out of women's sports. Can you imagine? And I will sign a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. No more, no more. What they're doing is crazy. These are some of the things that we must do, but things that are very important to this particular audience. We have to do a lot of other things, but this particular audience wants to know how we feel about that. For those of you who live in Tennessee, I love this state. You know, we won the state by numbers that nobody's ever won. I love Tennessee. The primary is Tuesday, March 5th, less than two weeks from now. So get out there and vote. And I have a feeling you're going to vote for a guy named Trump, I think. So get out there and vote. And it's important to do it. Not that we have a race, because we really essentially don't have a race. Nikki is not a race. But we have to send a message to these radical left lunatics that on November 5th, we're coming. We're coming in numbers that they've never seen before. Because when the numbers are that way, and I think they have a chance of being that way, you can only cheat so much. You can only cheat so much. So we have to really get a — we have to let the world know that we're coming. We're going to come in big numbers, and on November 5th, we're going to get rid of a man who is the worst president in the history of our country, I think, by far. So get out and vote on the 5th. You got to get out and vote. Very, very near. Get out and send that message. But the big one is in November, but you got to send the message right now. So even though it's not much of a election per se, you got to get out there and you have to send that big, beautiful message that we're coming. For generations, America's religious broadcasters have helped the people of this country live up to the words of our glorious motto, in God we trust. We will never change that motto. You know, there are many, many people that want to change that model. That model will never change. That motto will — that motto will never change. It's a magnificent motto, and we've had it. And 
We're not going to let people talk about that. We'll never change. This great organization has helped spread the Word of God, the love of Christ, the stories of the Holy Bible, and the voices of famed evangelical people and evangelists, evangelists like the late, great Pat Robertson, who was a great gentleman. Got to know him very well. Great evangelist. And, of course, Billy Graham. How good was Billy Graham, right? I remember my father took me to Yankee Stadium, and Billy Graham was preaching, and it was amazing. I was very young. My father loved Billy Graham, and that place was packed bigger than any World Series game, bigger than anything anybody's ever seen, and it was packed. And uh, we would love to bring it back to those days, Jack, right? We'd love to bring it back to those days. Amazing. Our country would greatly benefit by it. Your efforts have inspired millions and millions to live their values and put faith at the center of their lives so importantly. And in turn, these legions of listeners, citizens, soldiers, ministers, and everyday American believers not only help defeat fascism and communism, they help to build America into the greatest nation in the history of the world. But now we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, its willpower, and its strength. We are a nation that has lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. We can't allow it to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. With your prayers, your voice, and your vote, we will reclaim our government from these horrible tyrants we will remove the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We will defeat crooked Joe Biden. We will restore faith and family to the center of American life, and we will restore power to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, with your help and God's grace, the great revival of America begins on November 5th, 2024. It's a great revival. So again, I want to thank you, and I want to thank the National Religious Broadcasters. I cannot state strongly enough what an incredible job you do. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.